Hello Raptors fans and welcome back to Raptors Report. Today we're going to be talking about the Raptors overtime loss to the Denver Nuggets 127 to 125. But before that happens, I want to continue a thread of discussion from the last video that I made about Scotty Barnes and the criticisms of him that have kind of been rolling in. And I think that last night was a really good case study in terms of what I was talking about. Uh, if you recall, if you watched the video or if you didn't, I'll just sum it up. Essentially what I was saying is that in the absence of Emmanuel Quickly and RJ Barrett, the offensive firepower of the Toronto Raptors, even with Scotty Barnes in the lineup, was limited. And that there were a lot of people who were judging his aggressiveness and his performance. And I was saying essentially that it was not fair to Scotty Barnes. And the reason that I think that is because one of the things that Scotty Barnes has repeatedly said on social media, he said it to the press, he has it listed on his socials. Many times he's expounded on the fact that he believes himself to be a point guard. And you can split hairs and say this or that. I don't know if I consider him a point guard. But one thing that I do notice about Scotty Barnes is that he does have a point guard's mentality. And what I mean by that is his approach to the game. One of the things that Scotty Barnes is notable about him is the fact that he likes to get his teammates involved and he is trying to make the correct play rather than forcing things. And I think that that's frustrating when Scotty Barnes is one of the only good offensive players in the lineup because his role has to be different in those scenarios. So when he is by himself, there's no Emmanuel Quickly, there's no RJ Barrett, the pressure is on him to score rather than be a distributor. So what I'm saying is that when he is passing the ball, when he's deferring, he get, he'll draw two defenders and pass out. In the context of a team that doesn't have many offensive stars, you could look at that and say, well, he's not being aggressive. But it makes so much more sense when you watch Scotty Barnes play with other talented offensive players. Last night is a perfect example. When the game started, RJ Barrett was on fire. He had it going, he was getting the ball. Scotty Barnes was feeding him, getting him the ball in his spots, getting him the ball, curling to the rim. He was finishing with the left, he was shooting open jump shots. He looked like he was on fire. And what Scotty could do was he would bring the ball up, they would run one of their sets and he could distribute the ball. And RJ Barrett played the role of the play finisher. And when you watch a point guard, especially back in the day, say, Steve Nash, back when pass first point guards were more of a thing, the point guard would try and bend the defense and of course score the ball if they could, but there was more of an onus on setting your teammates up. So Steve Nash, they've gone into depth, him and Mike D'Antoni, they've said that if they were to redo things, they would probably get him to shoot the ball more. But back then on those Phoenix teams, one of the things that he did so well was getting his teammates involved early, passing the ball, finding guys in their spots so that they can get a good shot opportunity, letting everyone eat instead of dominating the ball. And I think that when you watch Scotty, that is what he wants to do. He wants to find other players. He wants to make the right play. So if he draws two defenders in the paint, he's gonna try and kick it out and find an open shooter. And when there are talented offensive players on the floor, it's gonna look so much better when you have a star that is so unselfish. And look no further than last night's game. There is a player who perfectly fits that description, Nikola Jokic, who is a deadly interior scorer. And he'd probably be a one of the greats, even if he wasn't the best passing big man of all time, just because of how dominant he is scoring the ball in the paint but it makes him such a much more dangerous player. The fact that he is an elite passer who can find open players. That is a, that makes your offense much, much more potent and it makes you as a player much harder to guard. Double teams against certain stars who aren't good passers works like a charm. There's a reason why teams double players is because it reduces their effectiveness. And if you put the tools around Scotty Barnes, guys who can hit shots, guys who can score at the rim, he is going to be so much better as an unselfish player. So I think that I should, I wanna mention that because I think last night's game was a good case study in that department. And of course, elephant in the room, kind of burying the lead. Scotty Barnes got injured last night. Nikola Jokic unintentionally 
elbowed him in what looked like the temple. He was really shaken up, Scotty. Gosh, it was kind of scary watching him being helped off of the court. He looked completely out of sorts. I, I hope he's not that badly hurt. I'm not a doctor, but it looked like he might have been concussed. I just, I hope he's okay. I mean, not even just from a, the team needs him standpoint, but I hope he's, I hope he's all right. And from a team standpoint, it seems like the Raptors can't really catch a break this season. RJ Barrett comes back. Scotty Barnes goes down. Not fun to watch a team that is so obviously talented. I think that they have really surprised me, in fact, with their level of competition. I think they played the Nuggets really, really well last night. And unfortunately, I, I think perhaps they would have won the game if Scotty Barnes didn't have to be taken off of the floor. I thought that he had a couple of bad moments in the fourth quarter, but he had a lot of really good moments too. And they were ahead when he left the game. So really unfortunate, they fell in overtime. It seemed a little bit inevitable after Scotty Barnes went down, but they did have an opportunity at the end of the game to win it. So maybe I'll talk about that during the player evaluations, which we will start right now and we'll begin with RJ Barrett. And RJ Barrett had it going really well in the first quarter. He was scoring all over the place, inside, outside, hitting threes, making layups with his patented lefty drives. He looked fantastic. He cooled off after that and he was not as effective. Christian Brown did a good job covering him in the second half of the game. And he finished with 20 points on 21 shots, uh, five rebounds, three assists, two turnovers. I'm gonna cut him a break. He just got back. He looked really good in different parts of the game. He did have a tough second half and overtime, but he did have a couple of really, really good highlight moments. The first quarter where he was on fire was fantastic. He had a poster dunk on Aaron Gordon after that kerfuffle underneath the rim when Scotty Barnes got flagrantly fouled by Russell Westbrook. I'm just so sick of Westbrook. But yeah, RJ Barrett had a solid game. And I think that I, what I want to address is the final shot because there were a lot of people criticizing it online. I think that I call it how it is. I don't want to be seen as a homer guy who just says everything is okay no matter what the circumstances, but I don't mind that shot too much. I think not calling a timeout, there's pros and cons to allowing a team to get their defense set versus getting to run a play yourself. I think there's pros and cons there. The Nuggets are a very well-oiled machine. They have a ton of veteran talent. They can maybe sniff out plays that are gonna happen. And so maybe it's not the worst idea to come down the floor and shoot before the defense is set. And in terms of three versus two, so RJ Barrett shot a three when the Raptors were down two, and there's some arguments to be made for that. First of all, Scotty Barnes is out. He's not coming back to the game. Do you wanna play another overtime against one of the best teams in the league? I don't know. I don't know if that's a great idea. Maybe it is best to go for the win there. And second of all, the timing of the shot, people thought compared it, I saw someone compare it to the Denzel Valentine shot where the commentators chewed him out on the broadcast. It wasn't that bad. If you want to shoot a shot, the time that he shot it was almost actually perfect because if you're down two, what do you want? If, if the shot for three to win the game doesn't go down, what do you want? You want offensive rebounds so that you can get a put back. So the time he shot it was actually great. That's exactly when you want to shoot it, as evidenced by the fact that the Toronto Raptors got a couple of kicks at the can. In fact, Jakob Pertl grabbed the offensive rebound and had a chance to put it back in for the tie. But it wasn't in the cards and the Toronto Raptors lost. And it was kind of a double loss just based on the Scotty Barnes news. I've already discussed Scotty Barnes a little bit, so we'll just talk about his stat line. 21 points on 19 shots, 12 rebounds, nine assists, five steals, one block, four turnovers. I thought it was a great Scotty Barnes performance. I thought that he was composed. He was, as I mentioned, distributing the ball, finding guys, getting into the paint and scoring. I thought it was a really balanced performance and there were a couple of turnovers in the fourth quarter, but for the most part, I think that he was running the show very well and admirably. I am impressed with Scotty Barnes and I really hope he makes a quick recovery. Next up, we will talk about Jakob Pertl because I know that he got cooked by Jokic in the fourth quarter, but let's please keep this in context. Nikola Jokic is a three-time MVP. He is arguably, and in my opinion, the best player on planet Earth right now. And I think that Jakob Pertl did a pretty good job 
guarding the Nuggets for the majority of the game. And in fact, a ton of the damage that Nikola Jokic did was in the third quarter when Jakob Pertl was sitting. And the reason he was sitting, I saw some people talk about, well, why aren't they matching the minutes with Jakob Pertl and Nikola Jokic? The reason is, is because Nikola Jokic, despite his looks, is a has excellent stamina. He can play over 40 minutes and regularly does. And the Nuggets needed every single minute that he played because they were down big. They had to ride him in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, and into overtime. So... That's the something to keep in mind. And in the first half, Jakob Pertl, along with Davion Mitchell, did a very good job containing the elite pick and roll between Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. They, he did a really good job hedging and then recovering to Nikola Jokic before he could get the shot away and containing Jamal Murray coming off of that screen. And another thing that is very important to notice Okay, he had 19 rebounds, 19 rebounds, eight of them offensive, 11 defensive. Nikola Jokic is an offensive rebounding machine. What he does is he is so big, he just, as soon as the shot goes up, he is underneath the basket and he's ready to tip in the putback. Multiple times last night, Jakob Pertl, as soon as the shot went up, went and pushed Nikola Jokic under the rim, under the net under the backboard, away from the rebound. If he does not do that, Nikola Jokic is grabbing the offensive rebound and putting it in. So you may, I mean, Nikola Jokic used his bag of tricks, his in, in, incredible array of post moves and scored on Jakob Pertl multiple times in the fourth quarter. And Jakob Pertl did leave him open on the perimeter for a three point shot. I mean, a lot of people were mentioning that. In my opinion, I think he wanted to stay with, I believe it was Jamal Murray on the perimeter. He didn't want to rotate to Jokic because then he would be leaving open a better shooter on the perimeter. I think he was expecting somebody to come up and challenge the shot other than himself. And Jokic hit a very big three in the fourth quarter. I will say that Jakob Pertl had a good game, okay? That might be controversial, I don't care. Uh, 16 points, 19 rebounds, two assists, a block, and two turnovers. I thought his defense was good, very good. And he just got outmatched by a Hall of Fame player, one of the best players of all time in Nikola Jokic. And there's not too much shame in that. Next up, we will talk about Davion Mitchell. Davion Mitchell had, a, I think, a pretty good game. 16 points, five of 10 shooting, three of six from three, two rebounds, six assists, a block, and yes, four turnovers. And it wasn't always pretty. But one thing that is good to note is that he was knocking down his open threes. And in the context of RJ Barrett coming back into the lineup, he looks much better. And the reason is because he can play off of RJ Barrett. RJ Barrett is the secondary creator in the starting lineup when Emmanuel quickly is down and might even be even when quickly is there. I think that he is the guy who's going to be handling the ball second most after Scotty Barnes and doing a lot of the creation. And when he does that, the role players who are less adept at being on the ball, so hello, Davion Mitchell, those guys are gonna look a lot better. And Davion Mitchell was able to keep it simple. He, he could make easy passes to guys who were open and he could take uncontested three point shots off of catch and shoot opportunities. I think he did that pretty well. And even throughout the game, I thought he did a good job on Jamal Murray. It's very hard. Jokic sets ridiculous screens. They're just so wide and huge and very difficult to get around. But I think that he did an okay job on Jamal Murray, except on the final possession of regulation, where Jamal Murray was able to get a little too free on the Jokic screen and then had that reverse layup because Pirtle couldn't get there in time. Other than that, I think he did a good job on defense and he did an okay job on offense. He's not really a point guard, but with enough creators in the lineup, he doesn't really have to be. Last up in the starting lineup, we've got Grady Dick, who I think had an uneven game, although he had his moments, especially in the fourth quarter in overtime. He got hot from three to get the Raptors back into it. He was struggling with his shot earlier in the game. He had a couple of plays where he would get inside and not be able to get it to drop. So it wasn't a stellar performance on the offensive end. And on defense, he still needs work. I don't want to sugarcoat it. 
Grady Dick is not a good defender yet, and other teams know it. Other teams get the big cartoon dollar signs in their eyes every time Grady Dick is covering one of the top creators on their team. So when he's on the floor, it gets a little bit more difficult to stop penetration, but he does add that extra little ingredient of being able to get hot at any time and score in a variety of ways. But I wouldn't say last night was a stellar Grady Dick performance but he is a second year player. Growth at this stage is all about two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. The game before was obviously the, one of the high points, if not the high point in his career. So by comparison, last night's game is not anything to write home about. I still think he can be better, especially on the defensive end. Next up, let's talk about the bench. So if you noticed, Bruno Fernando did not play last night, which I've been saying throughout the preseason and coming into the season, he would probably be the weakest part of the rotation. And with RJ Barrett's return, the minutes get a little bit tighter. So he did not play. I thought it was interesting I, uh, just to point that out. Chris Boucher didn't have a great game. Four points on six shots. He had three rebounds and a block. He had some interesting plays, a couple of highlights. He only played 14 minutes. The Raptors kind of rode their starters. But yeah, not, not a great Chris Boucher game. Didn't really make a huge impact. Didn't shoot the ball particularly well. The guy who did have a really good game off of the bench and continues to impress. And in my opinion, to be quite honest, if it was simply from a skill and fit standpoint would probably be the guy I would put in the starting lineup, Ochai Agbaji. He pretty much did it all. He had 15 points. He was six for 12 from the field, two of five from three. He continues to be a reliable corner three point shooter seven rebounds, a steal, a block, uh, no turnovers, and great defensively. What can you say? This guy has been doing it all for the Toronto Raptors and really stepping up. I am blown away. I was a Ochai Agbaji doubter. He has done everything that I have hoped for. He's shot the three well. He has contributed in multiple areas. He's no longer invisible. Last season, he would go long stretches without doing very much. This season, he is doing almost everything. Grabbing rebounds, running the break, getting inside and finishing, shooting corner threes. He's not deferring from three. You can tell his confidence has taken a big step forward. And in my opinion, I would probably give him the start on most nights. I think he's earned it. Jamal Shedd came off of the bench and did his thing. He is looking good. He had eight points, uh, five assists, one rebound, one steal, and only one turnover. Uh, I think that he is a very heady, very smart player who plays with a ton of energy on both ends. And other than a couple of questionable three-point shots, uh, especially later in the game, I think that he made the right play almost every time. And you can tell that he is, he plays with a lot of intelligence and passion. And it is very difficult to dislike a player that can do that. He has really helped the Toronto Raptors bench go from being the laughing stock. In my opinion, they, the Raptors have had the worst bench in the league or close to it for the past almost five years. There have not been many contributors off of the bench for the Toronto Raptors. And Jamal Shedd has been magnificent as the backup point guard, running the show, making the correct play, playing with energy, giving them a burst, using screens, being a good pick and roll player. Yeah, I'm, as everybody has been saying, they are shed heads and I am a shed head for sure. He has played really well for the Toronto Raptors. And speaking of another rookie, Jonathan Mogbo had a pretty good performance as well. He only had six points, three rebounds and an assist. But when you watch the guy, you can tell there's something there, okay? It's not gonna show up in the box score every night, although he is kind of a stat stuffer. He, he goes and fills up almost every column every night. But when you watch him play, he's making the right reads. And it is a pleasure to have two rookies that know how to play right out of the gates, even three rookies. There's another guy I'm gonna talk about who matches that description as well. He can play defense inside out. He can guard inside and, and contest shots at the rim. And if he gets switched out onto a perimeter player, he can swivel his hips and stay in front of guys out there too. He's kind of like, I know that it's such a lazy comparison and really <laughs> the reason that people make it is because of the hair, but he's kind of like a leveled up version of Precious Achua, like an idealized version of Precious Achua. 
One of Precious Achua's biggest strengths as a player was his ability to guard inside out. So you could have him do some stuff around the rim. He wasn't the best rim protector, but he gave you a little bit there. And then if there was a switch and you welcomed the switch almost, if there was a perimeter player who wanted to try him on the perimeter and try and drive past him, try and ISO against him, he would shut it down with his very quick feet and very good hips. And Jonathan Mogbo is very similar in that regard. And you can tell that he and Scotty Barnes have a lot of chemistry. They have been friends for the better parts of their life. They've been playing basketball together. They know where each other's spots are. They know where they're going to be. Scotty Barnes hooked him up with a bunch of dimes. He's playing with energy, playing with passion and playing the right way. And I think one of the reasons for that is that most of the rookies that the Raptors are playing this year, Jamal Shedd, Jonathan Mogbo, and Jamison Battle are all older rookies. Jamison Battle, in fact, played in college for five years for three different teams. So you're getting guys with more experience. They're still pretty young, but they're coming in. They're not physically immature and they've, they've got a little bit more basketball sense than a rookie who's in their teens or a freshman. There's less of a learning curve there. They're able to come in and play at a high level right off of the bat. So that's what we're seeing from Jamal Shedd and Jonathan Mogbo. And as I mentioned, Jamison Battle. There is a bit of sad news with Jamison Battle. Last night was his first game in a Toronto Raptors uniform where he did not make a three-point shot. Yes, that's correct. He was 0 for 2 from 3. He finished with four points, uh, a rebound, and a block. I think he still played okay. His defense is not that bad. He is a bigger guy. I keep talking about how big Jamison Battle is, but you can tell that he's not a complete stiff on the defensive end. I don't think he's great, but he's not a stiff. And in fact, Nikola Jokic got him in the post and he just went vertical, put his hands up, jumped a little bit and challenged the shot just enough that Nikola Jokic with his magic touch missed the, the shot. So that was impressive. And I've kind of waxed poetic about how Mogbo and Jamal Shedd play smart. I think Jamison Battle kind of has it figured out as well. He's ready to step in and play some significant minutes and you're not going to get a ton of rookie mistakes. So I thought he played okay. I think the Raptors played the Denver Nuggets very well last night. When Scotty was playing, they were beating them. They had a great first half. The Nuggets were desperate to get this win. They played Nikola Jokic the entire third quarter. When Scotty Barnes went down with injury, that was kind of the death knell for the Toronto Raptors. They couldn't get over the finish line. The Denver Nuggets are a veteran, battle-tested team. They went to their bread and butter to get them the buckets at the end of the game, and it worked. And the Raptors struggled down the stretch without Scotty Barnes. They turned the ball over too much, has been a common refrain. But there were big positives to take away from the game. And RJ Barrett made his return. I thought he looked solid. I don't think it was the best game from him, but I think that it goes to show how much more sense the team makes when he plays. I thought the Raptors had a chance to win this game and things were looking good. I think the team has been surprisingly competitive this season. There's only been one real bad loss, which is against the Cleveland Cavaliers. So if the Raptors are going to quote unquote tank this season and lose games, this is kind of how I want them to do it. I want the games to be entertaining. I don't want them to be stomps. I mentioned in the last video that the Nuggets have kind of been a bit wobbly and we saw it last night. Their bench is very anemic. They really lost the first half when they went to their bench with Russell Westbrook and Dario Saric. They looked horrible. The Nuggets had to incorporate starters into their bench lineups. Those guys had to play with the bench for extended periods of time in order to just get them over the hump and beat the Toronto Raptors. So it was an encouraging performance from that point of view. The Toronto Raptors play a game tomorrow against the Charlotte Hornets in Charlotte. And this is, you cannot discount this version of the Charlotte Hornets. And I know that their record isn't particularly good right now. They have been improving as well, and they've got some guns. They've got some players on their team. They will be playing in their building. So it will be a very tough game, especially if Scotty Barnes and Emmanuel quickly are missing. So the Raptors could lose this game pretty easily to the Charlotte Hornets if things don't bounce their way. No matter how well the Toronto Raptors played the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Denver Nuggets, it doesn't matter. Each game is a separate entity, and when you're missing a lot of talent like the Toronto Raptors could be, teams like Charlotte Hornets, who are relatively healthy and have young talent as well, and they're in their building, I would say I actually give the Hornets a bit of an advantage there. So don't be too 
angry if the Toronto Raptors lose tomorrow night. I'm not that confident if Scotty Barnes sits. If he plays, I think that there's the Raptors have a good opportunity to win. If he sits, I would probably give the Hornets the advantage there. But that's it. That's the video. I hope you were able to take something away from it. I hope it was interesting to listen to my thoughts, especially about Scotty Barnes and RJ Barrett. But what do you think? Do you think the Toronto Raptors are completely sunk if Scotty Barnes has to sit for a prolonged period of time? What do you think of RJ Barrett's performance last night? Was it a hit? Was it a miss? What do you think of his last shot? Let me know here in the comments and also on Twitter, where you can reach me at Raps Report. Please subscribe and like the video if you haven't. But as always, thanks for tuning in to Raptors Report, your source for in-depth Raptors content.